Christian Andrea Akino, I believe is how you say his last name. Uh, it looks like Andrea Gino to me. Uh, I, I'm so bad with names. I mean, no disrespect. Uh, I listened to several videos and they all said it differently. So I deep dove on this one and you probably know about it, but I thought we could talk about it together. Now, Christian may have hailed from landlocked Meridian, Mississippi, but according to many of his family members, he dreamed of a life that he spent on the water. He knew from the beginning that he wanted to work on a tugboat, and as soon as he turned 18, he got a job. He worked on the same boat in the Mississippi River called the Magnolia Marine until his death three years later. He had been promoted twice in his time on this boat. He was making a lot of money. He was happy buying the things that he wanted. He had his own apartment and he wanted to be the youngest captain at the Magnolia Marine. And according to his father, Todd, he was well on his way to doing just that. And from everything I read, that's exactly true. Now, along with Christian's drive to succeed came his unbridled joy for life. But his mother, Ray, and his father, Todd, were a little concerned about the new love in Christian's life. Now, this enters 17-year-old Whitley Goodman. We'll talk a lot about Whitley in this case, so remember her name. Initially, Christian's mom said she was very sweet, cute, just this little blonde thing. And Willie actually lived with Christian's family for some time. She described a very chaotic childhood, and Ray thought that that was something Christian wanted to save about her. He wanted to come in and take care of her, and, you know, he had the money to do so, and, you know, all that glitters is in gold, and after the first month, their relationship kind of started to go downhill a little, and Ray recalls starting to become concerned with their relationship, and Christian's parents went to him and said, she can't stay here anymore. Uh, her reputation was not very good uh, for a 17-year-old. That's uh, not uh, something you want to hear. But now, Christian worked 30-day hitches on the tugboat, and he decided to get an apartment in Meridian with his older brother, Josh, who also worked long stretches on the tugboat. And uh, Ray, his mom, said, well, Whitley needed somewhere to stay, and Josh needed someone to move in with him to help with the rent and, you know, take care of the apartment when he wasn't there, because that's a long time to be away. And so it worked out for Christian and Whitley to move in with Christian's brother, Josh. Christian, brave man that he was, also let Whitley drive his car which was a BMW around while he was out on the 
messages that were found later that she did tell Christian that she thought she was pregnant, but a couple days later said she wasn't pregnant, so, you know, was she playing him? I don't know. Uh, Ray kind of suspects a little foul play, she said. She thought that Whitley had found out that he had a life insurance policy at his job that his previous girlfriend was the beneficiary of, and Whitley did not like that at all. Um, I'm gonna do a ramble video pretty soon, and we're gonna talk about life insurances and beneficiaries and things like that from something that's been going on in my life, so look for that pretty soon. Anyway, back to Christian. So, during these long spells on this tugboat, Christian... Oh, hey, my new furnace makes a strange noise when it turns on now. I really hope you can't hear that. Christian began to have his doubts about Whitley and there was a lot of conflict happening in their relationship. On the day before um, Christian supposedly committed suicide, he received several phone calls from his good friend Dylan. Dylan's last name is Swearingen, and we will also talk quite a bit about Dylan. Dylan calls Christian and he says, I have seen Whitley driving around in your car and she's with this drug dealer and you gotta come home and fix this dude because she's all over so um, Ray says to several you know news services and in several articles that I read that a female cook aboard the tugboat named Cheryl Stanley backs up this this um, claim that Dylan said all this, that she was nearby when Christian got these phone calls. Cheryl said um, he was in a good mood the day that all of this happened. He was just gonna go get his car from her, lock up his apartment, and make Whitley go back to her grandma's, because uh, he was done. And then he would be back to the boat for crew change at 5.30 that evening. Now, unbeknownst to his parents, on the night of February 25th, 2014, Christian reached out to his boss and basically said, Hey, if I can find somebody to take my shift, can I go home and deal with this issue that I've got going on? I don't know if he got real specific about it or if he just said it was a family conflict. He secured a substitute and arranged for a friend to pick him up, Dylan, on the shore of St. Rose, Louisiana, on the morning of February 26th. Dylan picked him up outside New Orleans, and they drove back to Meridian and Christian's apartment. Now, this is where things get a little unconfirmed. I guess is the word. According to a timeline that I found created by Christian's family's attorney, based on phone records, police reports, and witness interviews, Christian's debit card was used at a gas station in Bacune, Mississippi around 9.24 a.m. Christian and Dylan arrived at the Willow Ridge Apartments in Meridian around 11.30. Now, Whitley was at the apartment at this time. From then until about 5 p.m. the next day, or that day, sorry, the only two people anywhere near Christian were Whitley and Dylan. Each of them, of course, have a completely different version of what happened between 11.30 and the time that the police arrived to find Christian's body in the bathroom. Dylan told the police that when he and Christian arrived at the apartment, Whitley and Christian immediately began arguing. That sounds reasonable to me. Dylan said that during the course of this argument, Christian put a gun to his
his head and threatened to shoot himself. Willie, however, never mentioned this to the police. After this situation was diffused between Christian and Whitley, Dylan said he told them he was going to get food and he asked them if they wanted anything. Dylan says that Christian gave him his debit card and told him to go pick up the food. Dylan also said, and I don't believe a word of this, that Christian told him also to go to the credit union and take all of his money out of his bank account. In addition to going to the store to fix Whitley's phone, which had reportedly been broken in the argument. Okay, you're breaking up with her. You want her to move out. She's driving around with a drug dealer, but let's fix her phone first. Uh, unless you threw it and smashed it against the wall, you don't have to fix anything, and uh, I don't know what happened to the phone, so. Now, Dylan is seen on video footage at Christian's bank attempting to withdraw money at around 12.30 p.m. He was not able to get this money because in all of this giving of the debit cards and stuff and please take all my money, uh, Christian didn't give him his PIN number. How mysterious. Around that same time, he calls Christian's phone. This does make me wonder, is he still alive at this point? We'll talk about that a little bit more. But So Dylan goes back to the apartment later that afternoon after making a trip to Best Buy and to get food. When he got back, he saw Whitley asleep on the couch. And at this time, he goes upstairs to look for Christian, who he finds in the bathroom. Christian is slumped over the bloody bathtub. Now, Whitley's description of these events differ in a couple ways. Whitley never mentioned to the police, as I said, about Christian putting the gun to his head. She didn't say it that day. She didn't say it later in interviews that she had given. And in fact, that night when she was being driven to the police station, she told the investigator that she doesn't remember that she had ever heard Christian talk about hurting himself. Whitley said that because she had taken Xanax the night before, she slept through the gunshot that killed Christian and did not wake up until Dylan came back to the apartment. No. <laughs> no. But whatever. Dylan calls 911 to report that he has found Christian in the bath. Well, he's leaning over the bathtub. The police show up and Dylan had Christian's driver's license and, you know, provided it to them as proof of identity. And the police go to Todd and Ray, Christian's parents, and they take the driver's license to confirm that it is, in fact, Christian. Christian's family is very obviously completely devastated, but they're also really confused. They do not believe that Christian would kill himself. They said it was not Christian. Why would he do that? He was coming home to run this girl off and to get his car back, said Todd. There was never any doubt in Ray's mind from the moment that she heard that they believed it was suicide, that she never accepted it. In fact, very few people did. Knowing Christian's character and his personality, they just don't believe that he did this to himself. Christian's family goes looking for answers, of course, but they're about to hit a wall of lies. Police, for once, performed gunshot residue tests on both Whitley and Dylan, and they both came back positive. Now, according to a private investigator, Dylan was never asked how did you get gunshot residue on you if you never entered the bathroom? And for her part, Whitley did 
was ever going to be prosecuted for this. But that's not the person that I met. What she was explaining was completely inconsistent with suicide. It was a physical impossibility for it to be suicide. What immediately caught Speechin's attention was the police report. They got there, the first officer did, at 5.05. At 5.43, they were pretty much done. At 6.30, they sent an officer to Christian's parents' home to tell Ray and Todd that their son had committed suicide. And when Speed Jens started working with private investigator Matt Mays, they learned even more disturbing details. All right, if you are, quote, the lead investigator and you arrive on a scene, this is your crime scene. In this particular case, according to private investigator Mays, when an authority figure arrives on the crime scene, some point afterwards, they tell everybody, wrap it up, it's a suicide. Chief Lee came in there and told them, shut it down, it was a suicide. He didn't even go upstairs to see anything that was going on up there, according to Todd. About a month later, when nothing had been done, Ray went to see then Chief Lee, and he said, this is a suicide. It will not be investigated. He told her, point blank, they wouldn't do it. And he told her the truth because they never did. On February 26th, 2014, the day of the suicide, Dylan and Christian got there at 11.30 in the morning. An hour later, Dylan is observed on the bank security camera trying to withdraw all of Christian's money, as we talked about. And when Dylan is asked about this, he told them that he had gone there to withdraw all of the money. And they asked, well, why did you do that? Because he wanted me to have it. But apparently, this didn't cause the police any concern, either. I don't understand. So this guy's trying to take all of Christian's money. He had gunshot residue on his hands. He says, okay, I come back around four. Whitley's sleeping. I go looking for Christian. I go upstairs. I knock on the bathroom door. Christian is slumped over the bathtub. His upper body in the bathtub and a gunshot wound to his right temple. When Dylan made this 911 call. He said that he had seen blood spatter on the stairs. Now, if Christian closed the door on the bathroom, because Dylan just said he knocked on it right, and leaned into the bathtub and shot himself, why is there blood spatter on the stairs? Um, another cause for concern was the position of the gun. The gun was found wedged between Christian's left thigh and the bathtub. He was shot in the right temple. And you don't have to be super smart to realize that those two things don't work. Despite all of this, Meridian police released Whitley and Dylan that night, and neither one of them has ever been arrested or charged with Christian's death. So, according to attorney Cynthia Speechens, what they have is these two people saying that this young man committed suicide. It's physically impossible. They're obviously lying. They both have gunshot residue on their hands. So, I, I, Attorney Speechens, much like myself, is quite baffled. Meridian police um, claim Christian put the 45 caliber pistol to his head and pulled the trigger. Christian's grieving family says, no way. They're convinced Christian was murdered and they're willing to turn to criminal investigators if that's what it takes to prove it. They just want justice in whatever form that it might come in. They went to the apartment to actually collect evidence that the police did not 
stuffed behind the toilet and a knife that had blood on it, but nobody knows where any of that went now. They didn't bag it and take it to evidence. They just... We don't know what happened to those things, but I'm telling you, Christian did not change his clothes after he shot himself. Every time I'm filming. Loud neighbors. So, Christian's family turns to Dr. Jonathan Arden, world-renowned forensic pathologist who has worked on such cases as the Washington, D.C. anthrax attack and the D.C. sniper. And he said, From the beginning, I did have that feeling that something was not right with the death of Christian. The gun was basically wedged between his upper left thigh and the outside of the bathtub that he was leaning against. To make things even more curious, the entrance gunshot is in his right temple. Once he receives this gunshot wound, he's unconscious. He has no purposeful muscular activity like holding a gun or manipulating a gun. First of all, it's a very powerful gun. If you're leaned over and you fire a weapon into the right side of your head, there's recoil. The gun goes that way. I mean, you can just watch Law and & Order and get that. The gun should have been close to his hand, or certainly on the same side of his hand, and the arm and the body should have just collapsed in a heap, said Dr. Arden. It makes no sense for both of his arms to be on the outside of the tub. It makes no sense for the gun to be on his left side. It makes no sense for the gun to be wedged between him and the bathtub. And then there's the gun itself. 45 caliber semi-automatic. I don't know anything about guns, but according to Dr. Arden, the beauty or the functioning of a semi-automatic pistol, you pull the trigger and it fires. It reloads and you're ready to shoot again. In this case, the gun found with Christian had been fired and the hammer was forward or decocked as it is sometimes called. This makes no sense because if he had simply fired the gun and shot himself, then collapsed, the hammer would be back or cocked. But it wasn't. So someone had to physically do that. That's not possible when you've just fired a weapon into your brain. Another problem is the magic bullet mystery. The bullet itself is even more problematic, according to Dr. Arden. The bullet has not only blood, but some foreign material consistent with wallboard in the deformed nose of the bullet. So the bullet has had a strike against a piece of wallboard. Okay, that makes sense. Crime scene photos show a bullet hole in the wall, but it's directly behind Christian's body. There's no evidence inside of the tub of any bullet strike. If he's in the position that he was found in when shot, the bullet, after exiting his head, would have struck off the inside of
from the morgue. Christian has lividity that is well developed and staying in place on the back of his right leg. He was basically kneeling up against the outside of the bathtub with his knees bent, his calves facing directly up to the ceiling, and he developed lividity in his right calf even after the body had been moved to the morgue. Christian had to be placed post-mortem after death for a significant period of time with the back of his right leg facing downward. For Dr. Arden, this all adds up to one inescapable conclusion. Sorry, someone keeps texting me. Oh, okay, it was my mom. She can text me all she wants. In the case of the death of Christian, I feel very strongly and I've signed my name to a report that I believe this is a homicide, said Dr. Arden. This is what we call a staged scene. Someone has staged the elements of a death scene to try to create the impression that this was suicide. Unfortunately for whoever did this, though, they got it horribly wrong. Now, if Dr. Arden is right, why hasn't the Meridian PD investigated Christian's death as a homicide? Like, from everything I've heard and I have not even seen the pictures, that makes sense to me. Attorney Cynthia Speechin says it just hasn't been investigated. I'm not a law enforcement officer and quite frankly, the fact that the family had to hire me is quite offensive to me. This has been really hard on Ray. She said to look at pictures of Christian that neither one of us should have had to look at. Stuff that is just heartbreaking, says Todd. I have no idea what I'm dealing with. I've been in the criminal law on either the prosecution or the defense for 34 years. I've never seen anything like this. Nothing, says attorney Speechins. So, if Christian was murdered, why? Who stood to gain if Christian was murdered? His family dug deeper into the day that he died and uncovered what might be the most damning evidence yet. My dog is itching. Okay. <laughs> now, Christian's family, they have spent thousands of their own hard-earned dollars investigating in Christian's death, and they are determined to prove that it was a murder and not a suicide. Attorney Speechin says, you know this kid didn't commit suicide, and I don't know how the family lives with that. So, a grieving family has to fight to rule an obvious homicide as a homicide with their own money and their own time. Yes, says Ray, in Meridian, Mississippi, you do. The family definitely has an idea of who's responsible for Christian's death, and it's no surprise that it starts with the two people who were with him the day that he died, Whitley Goodman and Dylan Swearingen. As I said, neither one of them have been charged or arrested in Christian's death. Now, remember, Dylan was caught on surveillance trying to steal Christian's money. Well, take it, because Christian said he could have it. But a closer look at Ms. Whitley's actions that day raised some more questions. They found out that she had Dylan's phone in her purse. I'm sorry, Christian's phone in her purse at the police station. But she kept lying and saying she didn't know where it was. She didn't know where it was. And finally they told her, look, nobody's leaving until we get the phone. And she pulls it out of her purse. Oh yeah, I forgot. I stuck it in here. Yeah, I bet you did. At this point, Todd said, we knew something was wrong. Christian's phone records show on the afternoon that he supposedly shot himself at the time that Whitley was asleep on the couch. Seven calls were made from Christian's phone to Matt Miller. Now, Matt Miller is the guy that Whitley 
was assigned to look at the mountain of evidence that the family had gathered to prove that this was a murder. According to private investigator Max Mays, it appeared justice was finally within reach. He did a thorough, unbiased investigation, and his conclusion was, according to what he told us, this was a homicide. Did the detective document that? Well, I'm not sure, said Mays. We talked with him, and he says, this is not a suicide, this is a homicide. And as a matter of fact, he even got two warrants for, guess who, Whitley and Dylan. Now, um, there was a judge that said he did indeed sign active warrants for both of them to be arrested for murder. But if these are active, why aren't these two in custody? Christian's father, Todd, says, I have no idea. It's not up to me. If it were up to me, they would have been in custody three years ago. Now, from what I can find, reporters have not caught Whitley Goodman in person, but she did have a lot to say on Facebook one late night. According to Whitley, she has never been a suspect. The warrants for arrests have never been activated, but were simply written to shut Ray up. Ray is Christian's mom, remember? In fact, Whitley claims, Whitley claims that all Ray has done is publish lies and try to get money and attention from her own son's death. As for the forensic evidence that concludes Christian's death with a homicide, she says, if anything was up with the ballistics or the body positioning, I would be in jail. She goes on to write, I can tell you he killed himself, and so can his threatening texts when he was states away. She said that there's no active warrants, and if anyone publishes it, it's false information. And then, to whoever she was talking to, she said, there's a special place in hell for people like you. So for now, Christian's family is waiting to find out whether or not the U.S. attorney will agree to review and hopefully prosecute in this case. Ray says, quite frankly, I just want her arrested. She's running around at the beach, posting on Instagram, and living her life. Attorney Cynthia Speech Speet Jins says, I truly grieve for this family. The murder or the death, no matter what, of your child. There's a life before that day, and there's a life after that day. And you throw in that he just wanted to end his own life. That's just beyond imaginable. So, let's talk about this just a little, and hope that my neighbors don't interrupt for the 50,000th time. Um, okay. This, in my mind, is clearly a homicide. I believe that 
because there was no, uh, I don't know if there was blood anywhere else in the bathroom. I know that they said that the bullet went into the wall directly behind him. So in that case, to me, his head was turned the other direction. I don't know exactly where the exit wound was, but clearly it wasn't in the back because then that wouldn't explain, that would explain the bullet being directly behind him. But that 